things about living in Hansworth are it's a multicultural community. It's very diverse. There are lots of different ethnic groups. 50, 60 different languages we all get on. Come for the food. West Indian takeaways are the lick. It's proper home cooking. Just come. I'll show you around. <laughs> If Hansworth was an animal, I think it would be a lion cub. It has the potential to be ferocious, but it's also very cute. <laughs> Mark Steele's in town. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome to Mark Steele's in town, which this week comes from Hansworth, a quiet, cosy suburb of Birmingham, <laughs> where you can walk up and down all night and hardly hear a sound. <laughs> except for the odd shepherd tending his flock. <laughs> and the only police you ever see is the one Bobby on the beat loved by the whole community. <laughs> <laughs> and a place that is just so marvellously mixed. You just have the most wonderful accents. And my favourite one of all, actually, is the one you get from people who manage to sound so Jamaican and then without realising it, they go into Birmingham in the night of the all the way back to Jamaica again in the spears of a sentence. I love that. <laughs> now, strangely, Hansworth does have a reputation for being a bit lively, uh, so I wanted to redress that image and show that it's a myth that this is an area just dominated by crime and civil unrest. So, to start with, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the first thing it says is this. Hansworth is an inner-city area of Birmingham known for its high crime rate and civil unrest. <laughs> Oh, this is Wikipedia. Anybody can change that, but none of you have bothered. <laughs> you must see it and go, yeah, that's about right. Marvellous how, marvellous how accurate this is, isn't it? And then I always get uh, taken round an area before doing the show by someone who knows the place well. And uh, if I'm honest, this is the only time that the person taking me round has said the words, see those steps? That's where they started firing at a police helicopter. <laughs> should be on a tourist brochure to attract holiday makers. You could get old couples going, oh, well, we thought that this year we'd go somewhere a bit different, and it was so lovely, we had rice and peas up the Soho Road, and <laughs> then we spent the evening firing at a helicopter. It was, <laughs> it was so much more fun than worthing. Uh, what I, I really don't want to make out about Hansworth is the idea that it's gloomy. It really isn't. Now, I was walking down the Lozells Road, and I said, oh, this bit's all very new here. And I was told, yes, that's because the old building's burnt down in the riot. <laughs> and that's a good thing, you see. Now, I'm in other areas. They find their plans to modernise, get bogged down in bureaucracy. <laughs> but here, there's more of a can-do attitude. <laughs> Uh, Hansworth is about four miles from the middle of Birmingham. So if you come through the middle of Birmingham to get here, what you mustn't ever, ever do is miss your turning. <laughs> because then you'll be able to see Hansworth in the distance. You'll think, I'm nearly there. I'll be there in two minutes. But you're a fool. <laughs> because the road sign will say this lane for Birmingham East and straight on for Birmingham South and straight on then back in a complicated loop and sort of diagonally across for Birmingham South East. And it's round and round in a series of circles like you're in a game of Skelectrix <laughs> until eventually, thankfully, you run out of petrol and think, thank God for that, now the RAC can take me home. <laughs> so even if there was nothing in Hansworth, apart from crime rates and civil unrest, you'd get back here and think, oh, at last I can relax. Compared to the Digbeth interchange, having to dodge machine gun fire when you pop out for a packet of biscuits is a breeze. <laughs> But whatever the problems, transport and other problems, there is something compelling about Hansworth. And I will try to explain later on that, in fact, the modern world in many ways was designed and created in Hansworth. And to the outsider, I mean, it looks like a, a magnificent mix of Jamaican shops with yams and peculiar knobbly vegetables on stalls poking into the road. And there's a Sikh temple and Vietnamese Buddhists and Poles. So nothing ought to go wrong here, as you only need some ancient Greeks and you've got every god covered. <laughs> I can't help thinking, I know that Hansworth has the most appalling poverty in the Midlands, but they must be happy as you can get the most frightfully fresh ginger. <laughs> 
Uh, Handsworth seems to be the area that each incoming community into Birmingham comes to first. So every few years, Poles or Turks or a new group arrives, and it's as if each group gets given a little pack. Here's a couple of tips. The people you'll annoy the most will be the last lot who came before you. (laughs) And the people you'll be annoyed by the most will be the next lot that come after you. (laughs) Enjoy your stay. Uh, uh, Modern Handsworth was shaped in the 1950s when the first groups of people were encouraged to come here from the Caribbean. And there's been one person who has photographed Handsworth throughout all of that time. And not only has he photographed it, but he's been able to do it by being part of the community. And that is Van Lee Burke, I'm sure many of you know. (laughs) So, uh, uh, Van Lee, when did you first come to Handsworth? I came here in 65, 1965. So when people first came here, was that a, a big shock to the people from the Caribbean that came here? Of course, especially if it came in the winter. With all, <laughs> <laughs> with all the smoke coming out of the houses, the fact that there were so many houses that looked like factories. One man told me they looked like penitentiaries. Um, but I must say, a friend of mine once told me that he broke into a West Indian house just because it was so colourful. He was- <laughs> He said... He Broke said, in, just had a look around. Yes, he did. No. He said he passed there all the while and it was so bright in that house and he just wondered why. All the other houses were dark and dismal. So he broke in, had a look around. He didn't take it. <laughs> Uh, the other thing, so someone like myself brought up in the place I was brought up in, the thing that sounds so exciting was the blues parties. Well, they were an essential part of your Saturday night going out. You know, you go, went to the pub, have a drink, then to the club, and about 2.30 in the morning you move on to the blues. You could always find the blues on a Saturday, you just follow the noise, really. <laughs> and, the, you know, the, the vibration has been known to shatter the window. <laughs> Absolutely marvellous. Thank you very much, Ben. It's fair to say, I'm sure Vanley will agree, that immigration wasn't welcomed by everybody. Black people were barred from some pubs, there was a campaign to stop them driving buses, even some of the friendliness, or what was supposed to be friendly, must have sounded peculiar. Apparently young West Indians became known as the Tea Cosy Mob because of the woolen, red, gold and green hats. So the Birmingham Mail launched an investigation into why these lads wore those hats and concluded, I quote... When I asked one lad why he had a woolen hat, he replied, to keep my head warm. (laughs) There's an image of the racist as being the thug with the tattoos and angry and running around with, with weapons, but it can just as easily be this sort of thing. This is from the Birmingham Mail in 1988. A Birmingham club faces a weekly picket by demonstrators for operating a colour bar. The club that refuses to admit blacks or Asians is the Hansworth Horticultural and Allotments Association. <laughs> oh, God, that is spectacular. White supremacist gardening. <laughs> what was their argument? They're different skin frightens the gladioli. <laughs> Oh, racists are funny, aren't they? They spend 400 years forcing black people to work on the land, then all of a sudden say, now, even if you want to, you can't. (laughs) But the main tension from most people I've spoken to, it was really, it was with the police in the 1970s and the 80s. And uh, in a way, you can understand why, from a man called David Webb, who was a police superintendent in Handsworth. He tried to bring in community policing, but he quotes some of his colleagues. And of those he published, the only one of a series of comments that doesn't suggest that the police deliberately picked on black people was this one. (laughs) I don't even like reading this out, but here we are. Policemen are insulting about everyone, not just the coup. You hear remarks about poofs, patties, lesbos, women, students, the rich, the media, all foreigners, the Scots, the Irish, you name it, we hate everybody. (laughs) Now, I know this isn't the main point. I can't help thinking he could simplify that list. (laughs) Because he's mentioned some groups twice. (laughs) Like the nationalities that are already covered under foreigners. And if they ate all women, that must include lesbos. I mean, he's making extra work for himself. It's no wonder the police moan about having no time to do their work, is it? (laughs) So, the blues parties would get raided, the Acapulco cafe got raided. Each time it got tenser, and in 1985, there was a huge riot. Now, this was the 1985 riot, I should specify. I say that because if you put Handsworth riot into Google, it comes up, which one? (laughs) 
This is the only place where talking about riot sounds like you're talking about wine. I thought the 81 was particularly fruity. Some people, of course, prefer the full-blooded 85. Uh, various attempts were made to explain uh, what the cause of the riot. One policeman was reported as saying, when these people have their head full of pot, spurred on by the thumping beat of reggae records, they're not human anymore. <laughs> so that's how to turn people into fighting machines. Instead of marching and scrambling over walls, the army should train soldiers with a joint and some Jimmy Cliff. <laughs> led by everyone on pot. <laughs> oh, where have I put the petrol bomb? <laughs> oh, no, I think I poured it in the tea. <laughs> where shall we loot? Uh, can we do somewhere with a Terry's chocolate orange? <laughs> uh, one of the, the tragedies of Hansworth's image in the 80s is it became feared by some people. There's a book by an Irish journalist, Dervla Murphy, who lived here, and she said, Hansworth has an appalling reputation. People warned me never to walk alone in the park, day or night, never to go out in the dark, not to expect a regular mail delivery, as marauding packs of rasters terrorise the postman. <laughs> now, to start with it, I'm not the world's leading expert on Rastafarianism, but is an opposition to the postal service a central part of their religion? <laughs> Did Bob Marley sing, no postman, no cry? <laughs> uh, it wasn't all aggravation here in part. It must have been exhilarating. There, there were the carnivals, there were the Marcus Garvey days where the whole of Hansworth Park was packed. And there was still Pulse, who made an album called Hansworth Revolution, which for many people my age was the first reggae record we ever bought. It certainly was for me. And, um, <laughs> and still Pulse of Hansworth are the reason that I used to wander through Swanley in Kent, where I was brought up, the whitest town in Britain, wandering down the street singing, Babylon is falling. <laughs> and that is one of the reasons why it's a pleasure to be here tonight, Hansworth, to let you know that it's your town that was responsible for me getting my head kicked in. <laughs> I think in the 70s, England should not only have accepted West Indian culture, it should have put it at the middle of society. We should have had Rastafarians doing jobs like the weatherman. First, let a tell all had a massive rain cascading down from them heaven. Sent by the King of King to flood upon them earth. <laughs> then let a tell all them rascals scattered shower. <laughs> Blood, 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 drizzling our fierce. But I know I get vexed, for I'm an all part of them grand plan by Jarastafari to move low pressure across southern England. <laughs> Diana is back at nine tomorrow for an update. Celestia. <laughs> Since then, there has been immigration into Hansworth from so many groups. Vietnam, Poland, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. There's a family from Dudley, apparently. <laughs> if, uh... <laughs> and if you spend... I love spending time in cafes. It's perfect for me. You can go into the Dutch pot for rice and peas, to the London Sweet Centre for papri chat, or you can nip into Bing's, where you can order ackee, saltfish and plantains, then drive home, tidy the house, take the kids down the park... <laughs> Go to work, save up for a deposit on a house, have a midlife crisis, stroll back and be just in time to get served. <laughs> I reckon there are people that you see served in there who are getting meals they didn't order. The meal was ordered by their parents who never got served. They've died and left it in their will. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I gave up. I, I did give up. I waited and there was someone chalking days off on a wall. Like <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of betting shops here as well. Uh, I went to one and there was a crowd of blokes in there in hats creeping towards the middle of the room as the race went on, waving betting slips. Come on, Brayden Breezy! Come on, come on, come on, come on! And I went up to one and I said, God, if you don't mind me asking, mate, how much did you put on? He went, 20p. <laughs> I went to a Jamaican record shop and it took so long to buy a record. I was with family at the time. It actually beat my personal best. <laughs> uh, because they, I, mean, this, I find this an amazing thing, actually, about Jamaica. It's produced the four fastest people on the planet. <laughs> and several thousand of the slowest. 
the place I went in with Van Lee, every time I asked how much this record was that I was after, a CD, he had to tell me something else about how brilliant the shot was. See these discs? There's the best quality discs in Birmingham because they were recorded slowly. <laughs> These are the best quality discs in Birmingham because they're recorded on audio. I, I was like, what do most people record them on a lawnmower? And, he, and then he didn't have a machine for taking a card. So I asked where the nearest cash point was, and I realised that is quite a complicated question in Hansworth, isn't it? And he said, the nearest cash point's in the hospital. So me and Valley had to go down to the hospital, and we, I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm trying to buy a CD and I'm walking in and out of people being wheeled in and out of op I'm going to poke my head in to see a surgeon go, oh, before you stitch his liver up, can you lend me a tenner? I'm trying to buy a record. <laughs> and then uh, I found the cash point machine in the hospital, but it was broken. <laughs> so then they said, well, the nearest one, you're going to need to get a bus. <laughs> So, instead of being a place that people say, uh, whatever you do, don't go there, Hands were thought to be a tourist area, or to be celebrated as a, a place where you can visit the whole world in an hour. You get to see things like a Sikh temple, and you don't have to go to the Punjab, it's in the high street. <laughs> Uh, part, part of the point of a Sikh temple is it's open to anyone, and they go to huge lengths to provide free food for anyone who asks for it. Now, I've got to say, if religions had to start from scratch, none of the others would be able to compete with that, would they? <laughs> the Church of England moans that no one goes there anymore. Well, they would if you could just wander in at eight in the morning and go, Right, I'll have bacon, egg, sausage, tomato, beans, two fried slices, mug of tea, two sugars, please, reverend. <laughs> So at this point, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Aftab, who, uh, well, this is a really splendid book, talks about different people's experience of coming from rural Bangladesh and arriving in Handsworth. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the funniest one is when uh, a gentleman asked his wife, can you get the milk? And she looked at him blankly and said, I haven't seen any cows. <laughs> And that's true, that's how it was. But it's, what, what strikes me with all of this is the journey and the connectedness that we have. I went to Geneva the other day and they said, where are you from? I said, I'm from the centre of the world. <laughs> this is where the Industrial Revolution happened and that's why we're here today. It was through the Industrial Revolution that colonialism spread and they went out there and they brought us back here. <laughs> you know. I love the idea of them stood there in Geneva in front of the CERN particle accelerator being told, we're the centre of the universe, mate. <laughs> Thanks very much to Aftab. Thanks very much. <laughs> but there was a time, as Aftab quite rightly said, there was a time when the future of the universe was being worked out in Hansworth, in a place called Soho House, that was the meeting place of the Birmingham Lunar Society. Now, when I first heard about the Birmingham Lunar Society, I thought, well, what did they do, then? Did they sort of meet up every night, look up and go, yes, yeah, still there. <laughs> I was a bit worried last week, it was getting smaller. <laughs> But in fact, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, this group started meeting as they were obsessed with science. So they were radicals. There was Matthew Bolton, after which half of Hansworth seems to be named, and James Watt of steam engine fame. Uh, Wedgwood, the founder of the pottery firm, and they were all obsessed with electricity and thinking of the amazing ways it could change the world. So when Wedgwood said that he could use electricity to decorate his pots, one of the others said, What daring mortals ye are! To rob the thunderer of his bolts, and for what? To execute justice that would make the great of the earth tremble? No. To amuse your wife by decorating a teapot. <laughs> <laughs> so the new grounds at Soho House went through most of what is now the Soho Road and were filled with trees and fountains and exotic plants that they could study, and from there they could design some of the earliest canals, which makes them partly responsible for that fact that people in Birmingham always tell you that there are more miles of canals in Birmingham than there are in Venice, which I have to say I think misses the point slightly. <laughs> As with canals, it's quality rather than quantity. <laughs> You might as well boast that there's more paint in a warehouse in Luton than on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. 
The, the men of the Lunar Society discussed philosophy and collected art and were magnificently eccentric. One of them, called Edgeworth, invented a telegraph system that could bring the results of horse races quick enough that he could use it to cheat at betting. <laughs> and there were times when he celebrated winning so much that James Watt asked how much he'd put on and he said, 20p. <laughs> Like all great radical thinkers of the time, uh, they wrote books with magnificent titles. One of them, Henry Temple Croker, wrote a volume called The Complete Dictionary of Arts and Sciences, in which the whole circle of human learning is explained and the difficulties attending the acquisition of every art, whether liberal or mechanical, are removed. <laughs> Concise and to the point. <laughs> If he was naming this programme, he'd have called it A Complete Investigation into the Conurbation of Handsworth, in which every aspect of the neighbourhood is explored thoroughly, omitting only the internecine gang warfare for the purpose of preserving the life of the presenter. <laughs> He was more successful, though, than another of the group, James Keir, who announced he would write the first ever complete dictionary of chemistry. And according to this marvellous book, The Lunar Society... He then abandoned the dictionary after the letter A. <laughs> one of the books about the society, A Lost Landscape, says about one of the pools in the grounds of Soho House. Bolton was especially fond of this part of the garden, even after the second Mrs Bolton was found dead in it after some kind of stroke or fit. There's a problem that doesn't often crop up on gardeners' questions. <laughs> And we've got a letter here from a Mr Bolton who says that he's got a lovely pool which he does enjoy very, very much, but it is a little bit spoilt at the moment as it's got a dead wife in it. <laughs> Gardener's Question Time will be much, much simpler, of course, all round if it had been run by the Hansworth Horticultural Association. <laughs> Every week it could just go, welcome to the show. Now, this week Mr Jenkins says that he has green fly on his lettuce. Well, the most important thing is not to let any black people near it. <laughs> and the same thing goes for all the other problems that you've sent in. That's all for this week. Bye-bye. <laughs> but the event that had the most dramatic impact on them was the French Revolution. The Lunar Society had already started the first anti-slavery society in Britain. And they called for revolution in Britain. And then one member, Joseph Priestley, had his house burnt down by a religious mob. So Priestley then was a man who believed personally in God, but he also believed that the advance of society depended on everyone being able to freely exchange and debate ideas so that rational thought could create a world of tolerance and rights for all, whereas his opponents thought, let Bernie's house down. <laughs> Priestley was even invited to be a member of the revolutionary government in France, and it, it was from this group that the radical movements of Hansworth emerged. For example, there was a women's movement set up in 1825, and according to a book, uh, A History of Birmingham and Its People, in the mid-19th century, a group of young females formed the Maidens Club, where the members agreed to remain unmarried. But the club had to close down after most of them had got married. <laughs> But, in a way, these events seem to set in motion a battle that has gone on ever since in Hansworth, between groups battling for more people to be at the centre of creating society and others wanting to exclude them. There's a line, I think, from Joseph Priestley to Benjamin Zephaniah, the Hansworth poet who describes himself, I quote, as an angry, illiterate, uneducated, ex-hustler, rebellious Rastafarian. And that is the only line he's ever written that the police agree with. <laughs> Um, now, uh, I spoke to Benjamin on the phone about Hansworth, about his affection for the place, uh, which we can play in now, I think. So, Benjamin, you were brought up in Hansworth. That's right, yes. To my late teenage years, when I went abroad to a Mosley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was growing up, um, I remember uh, speaking to a guy who was Irish, and he said that when he was growing up, it was all Irish. And now, you know, the blacks are coming, the Caribbean people, you know, and then I heard uh, the, the Caribbean people complaining about the Asian people that were coming, and then the Asian people started complaining about the Poles that are coming, and the Poles will soon be complaining about the Azerbaijanis or somebody that's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you people from not just Jamaican background, they, they literally were born in Jamaica, they've immigrated to Hansworth, and they're standing on Soul Road going, what is happening to the country? All these people coming from Poland, they're taking our jobs, they're taking our women. Look at that, he's driving a Ford Capri. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a 
amazing how well people get on on the whole. You see a, a Polish guy who's speaking Hindi words and walking like a Jamaican, you know. I mean, you know, I said to a guy, I think he was from Lithuania the other day, I said, hello, and he went, well, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think just as you could trace a, a line from the radical Hansworth residents of the 18th century to the people trying to make more people feel part of the community now, instead of the mobs who burnt down Priestley's house, we've got institutions like The Sun. Uh, now, for example, they published a story about a Muslim bus driver in Birmingham who ordered his passengers off the bus so he could pray. But it was entirely made up and they had to pay a fine as they admitted the story was distorted. And I read this and I thought, well, the most unsettling part here is their utter lack of imagination. They could have at least made it more colourful and gone, the driver also insisted his bus route should only go east. <laughs> This means the 16A to Hansworth Wood will no longer stop at Great Bar, but go the wrong way up a one-way street through Thornhill Road Police Station and carry on to Mecca. <laughs> there are people now who say, oh, no, Hansworth ruled by the gangs, but it isn't. Hansworth is ruled by a million influences across time and space. It can look huge, Hansworth, because its impact on the planet includes steam engines and science. Its most famous poet is known across the world. Its temples are influenced by the Punjab. The whole world comes through Hansworth. So I, I will leave you with a document that I found in Soho House, written by the Lunar Society, that sums up, I think, the ingenuity and the impact of Hansworth on the world and of the world on Hansworth, written sometime in the 1780s. Our society has bestowed upon humankind the most wondrous discoveries. From our studies of Hansworth, it appears the inhabitants have a method of slowing down time itself, <laughs> simply by entering a record shop or a cafe known as Bing's. <laughs> Hospitals will one day be institutions that not only cure ailments, but shall provide a machine that promises to spew forth money. <laughs> Though with such ingenuity, it will never work. <laughs> and finally, in the future, there will one day, we are certain, be a majestic network, miles of concrete and flyovers, involving such advances in transport that it will be possible for mankind to cross the city of Birmingham in just 12 times as long as it takes today. <laughs> In Town was written and performed by Mark Steele with additional material by Pete Sinclair. The producer was Sam Bryant.